So, uh, good morning. Um, I salute the early birds and heroes of early morning panels. And um, thank you very much for coming. And I promise you that um, for this, for this early coming, you will be rewarded with the opportunity to listen to an absolutely legendary gentleman, legendary person. Seva Vsevolod Borisovich Novgorodsev has been the presenter of music and social cultural program, uh, programs for the BBC Russian service for um, several decades. And his voice is familiar for millions of, of uh, Russian-speaking people uh, of several generations. So as, as wonderful Michelle Daniel rightly called the book, and book is here, and I hugely recommend you to have it when it's out of print, Seva is a DJ who brought down the USSR. So I was lucky to work with Seva about 10 years in the 90s and 2000s. And today we will talk about the experience of his music programs for the BBC uh, and how his experience of that music and social cultural programs could be applied for um, for what we have now, because uh, we need to do something in cultural sphere, in sphere of uh, music and, and uh, connections with, reconnection with uh, Russians, I believe, uh, because now in this war against Ukraine, uh, Russia and Russia culture is, is going... Um, every day further from basic humanity. And, and as it was in Soviet times, and in Soviet times, Seva was, uh, he, he spoke with Russians with empathy. And with, uh, for, first of all, he um, understood what they need, what they want to hear. Uh, but of course, uh, it was also a cultural development for them. With me, Speaking with Seva is Jeff Trimble and my former colleague and now very successful independent journalist, Leonid Ragozin. Leonid Ragozin, I welcome you guys. Seva, good morning from us. Good afternoon in Bulgaria. Well, speak for yourself. It's not morning here. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. And um, so you joined the BBC in uh, 70s. I joined BBC in 90s. And there was a little event between two of these times, I mean, the collapse of the USSR. And book of Michelle suggests you brought it down. So uh, what, is, what are the differences between 70s and 90s? And can you please enlighten us with the development of, of your broadcast within these years uh, before I joined the BBC? Okay. Well, the main principle of uh, new hiring new personnel at the BBC was the so-called fresh blood policy, which means that the BBC ideally would like to employ professional journalists who spoke fluent English and could work in both languages, who had the necessary professional contacts. And in fact, you just take a figure from a person from one environment and put it into, into a data. However, at the end of 70s, and I joined in March 1977, there were no such journalists because if anybody of journalistic persuasion could, in speaking English, probably was working for one of the government branches of radio broadcasting, mostly under the umbrella of the KGB. And so the BBC had to find people who could speak English, no matter what his professional background was. And so they were hiring from Israel mostly, but some people in Europe. I was hired from Rome, Italy, to, to do the work. So when I entered the BBC in March 1977, I found a wonderful motley crew of people. There was a real doctor, 
with a beautiful baritone who would put you at ease and make you feel better automatically. There was a former master of sports, uh, Leo Fagin, who actually brought me to the BBC, who was the first author of the Russian English and English Russian Dictionary, which was destroyed just before the print because he was emigrating to Israel. There was a former model of the Moscow House of Fashion. There was an engineer in pre-stressed concrete and such and so on and so on, which means that people came into a journalistic profession with some different professional background. They knew something before they turned uh, journalists. And so the doctor was making his medical program, which was wonderful. Uh, engineers were talking about their subjects with a full understanding of it, and so on and so forth. And um, I was a former saxophone player <laughs> and a ship's officer because my first education is navigation. Is navi I'm a navigator, which means that um, it was a very alive, creative climate within the BBC uh, because people knew their audience. Doctor knew his patients, obviously, and engineer knew his workers. <clears throat> and they were all contributing in a, I would say, three-dimensional, not two-dimensional uh, mode. And that created a very... Um, very human communication with the audience. And I think that is what essentially created a climate which um, literally drew our listenership, our listeners to, uh, to our broadcasting. And that is, I think, what it was in the end brought down the, uh, the Soviet Union. Because you have to understand that in the Soviet Union then, Everything was strictly censored. Every news bulletin, every piece of paper that was read on air had to go through at least four, five, or even seven stages of checking, rechecking, censoring, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There was a joke about Leonid Brezhnev, who would always speak of the page and having a piece of paper in front of him. So someone rings him at the door, he goes to open it, um, takes a piece of paper from his breast pocket and says, now who is there? And in that climate, a free speech and different kind of personalities on air was very attractive. In the Soviet Union, Wherever you went, in all the local radio stations and all the television stations, the men and the women sounded absolutely the same. It was a standard they, they were trying to achieve. Men were pleasant baritones with beautiful diction, and uh, women were mezzo-sopranos, uh, sort of soft, velvety voices. And that was it. And they were all very formal because you couldn't make a mistake on air. Um, very reserved, very ideologically sound. And suddenly there was this BBC where people all sounded different because we were not proper presenters or dictors. I, I for instance, uh, had to fight my faults in, in diction <laughs> throughout the, my career. I would never go on air without first warming up. I have lazy lips, you see. Anyway, so that was it. And that was what made the BBC sound different, human, approachable. And uh, we had some empathy with our audience. For instance, my main fear on air uh, when I was preparing my programs was not to see what I call glass eyes. Now, this glass eyes was the, a syndrome which I picked up on my tours with the jazz band and later with the pop band all across the, the Soviet Union. 
If you come to a provincial little town, there's much, not much to do because the distances in Russia are huge and the number of people living in those vast territories is incalculable. And so whoever comes to this little town with a concert or a show draws everybody in, uh, who is who in, in this town. But obviously the first three or four rows are taken by the local mandarins, you know, people with influence, party bosses, and military uh, people in trade, etc. And I was with the jazz band first. And so there's this uh, Count Basie type of band on stage with all these trumpets and trombones and drums and now, the local party bosses don't exactly understand what we're playing, uh, but there's nothing else to do. And they came to be seen and to see other people. So they sit there and just pretend that they're interested. And that vacant expression in their faces, the so-called glass eyes, were a constant reminder to me that I have to be interesting, uh, warm, sympathetic, funny, uh, humorous, sometimes sarcastic, just to keep them in interested. And that was another stimulus for me because uh, my rock programs were all written scripts. And I would spend first eight hours to kind of knocking out a joke. Uh, now, to come up with a new conceptual joke that had never been before is actually a lot of work. And I was torturing myself every Wednesday for those uh, 26 years, which uh, I'm not complaining because it, it made me what I am and uh, honed my writing style, etc. Um, so, speaking about the jokes, uh, Nicholas yeah. Cole yesterday asked, asked a good question. Sh should we joke now about Putin? To what extent joking about Putin might hurt um, feelings of Russians, or it should be completely different? Yeah. When BBC started uh, broadcasting in Russia in 1946, it was put in the charter or in the kind of producer's guidelines that you can criticize ideology, you can criticize the politics and the results of those politics, but go no further. No personal comments were ever allowed on, on the BBC. And I kind of uh, grew up with this uh, tradition, with this charter, and I never allowed myself, nor would I tolerate others doing any personal comments, which is, um, well, it's seen differently, especially in Russia or Ukraine, because very often they start with personal comments, sometimes very kind of uh, non-correct non ones. So joking, yes, but not, not, not on a personal level. Although I remember your very witty jokes about Vladimir Lenin uh, when you advertised in one of your programs. I was about 14, I think, and I listened to this program about the Black Sabbath rock group. And you said that the Black Sabbath and Soviet Union is very well known as a, as a, as a weekend when people work. So, but we don't speak now about this, this strange days introduced by the, uh, by the decision of some witty guy who liked to ride uh, rail uh, paravozy, you say. So, so, so he, he, you've been joking about Lenin successfully. I'm passing mic to, to, to Jeff. He, he wants to come back at you first. Seva, did you have a response to that? It was not a joke about Lenin. It was a joke about forced labor on a legitimate weekend day off. It was called Subotnik or Sabbathnik, if you like. Chernia Subota. It, 
Chonda. And it, it coincided very well with the name of the group because it was Black Sabbath, Chorna Sabota. And I said, do you know what Black Sabbath is? Is when you have to work on Sabbath. Uh, that's essentially it. Um, it was introduced by Lenin, yes. And, and so I mentioned him just in passing. <laughs> Sava, good afternoon. It's Jeff Trimble here. You, you, you mentioned the charter, and uh, broadly speaking, and I'm now quoting again from Nick Cull's writings about public diplomacy, he describes five distinct ways in which international actors engage foreign publics, uh, listening, advocacy, cultural diplomacy, exchange diplomacy, and news international Broadcasting In your career in international broadcasting, you certainly were a part of cultural diplomacy. But to what extent, if any, were you given kind of broad direction about the kind of programming that you should do, subjects that you should touch on or not touch on, uh, or were you... Did you generally feel and were you independent in the way you put your programming together? I mean, just to follow up, the joke about Black Sabbath, that's so subtle that I have trouble imagining you even explaining that to your British bosses in your programming. So to what extent were you really on your own and how much guidance did you have about what kinds of things you were meant to project in your programming? Yes, I was lucky to be um, not to be a staff member. I left BBC in the 1984 because there was a lot of work for me as a film consultant with the Hollywood producers. So I worked from home for all those years from 84 onwards. But I, you are right, I had some problems with the management in around 1980. The head of the service was a, a proper aristocratic English lady, Mary Sitton Watson. And of course, he, she couldn't understand the tone that I was kind of working on trying to reach my audience. And um, the, um, the signal to start checking me was that... Um, there were reports that people listening to the, my program, and we started receiving letters in numbers that not previously observed. And so she asked me politely to present my scripts before I record them, and she was crossing out the, uh, the you know, the pearls, <laughs> the joke that I spent eight hours working on uh, would be crossed out. So that stimulated me to write in a way she wouldn't understand, you see. And probably by, um, by 1987, when I was uh, talking about Black Sabbath or 1984, um, it, it wouldn't be in checked at all because, you know, I was a, a stringer, I was outside contributor, and I organized everything in a way um, that um, no one would see me because I write at home. They, I would book the studio in the evening time um, when the management and the colleagues were not in their great numbers. And I would just record and put the tape on the shelf in the uh, allocated space for to be broadcast. Now, I knew that the management were very busy and they wouldn't listen to such you know, rubbish, um, uh, superficial stuff like a pop program. So it was just um, done in the best Soviet tradition, whereby I would pretend I am a simpleton who writes, uh, you know, programs for the uneducated youth, and they would have no time to check it. So this is how it, it went. I would like to uh, ask another generation of the BBC, former BBC employees, we all three here from the BBC, Lyonia. Uh, so uh, on, on your thought, um, what, what is the main difference of 2000s when you joined the BBC and the period Sieva is explaining? 
Well, I guess there is there is a huge difference uh, because when I uh, became a BBC staffer, um, that was already into the early uh, well, but, well, late Yeltsin years and early Putin years. Early Putin years is when I joined the uh, BBC Russian service, but I was in the BBC for the previous uh, three years. Um, so, I mean. One obvious thing, there wasn't the, the Iron Curtain, and uh, uh, we had uh, an office, uh, we had a bureau in Moscow, which was uh, expanding uh, very rapidly. Um, and um, it was possible to travel between uh, Russia and uh, Britain all the time. I would be spending uh, anything between three or seven months a year in, in Britain uh, while being officially, um, uh, while officially working in the Moscow bureau. Um, so, so that was that was a huge um, difference, I guess. Um, I uh, I can't really imagine uh, what it felt like to be uh, uh, so cut away from your audience as uh, Sieva was uh, back in the 70s and the 1980s. I mean, I appreciate that you were receiving the uh, letters from the audience, but it's, it's of course uncomparable with this uh, instant messaging on the internet, uh, which was available when I, when I was joining the BBC, and uh, uh, you could you could immediately feel and understand what what the audience is up to, and you. you just you felt the audience. Um, I was actually going to uh, to ask um, uh, Seva because I'm I'm based in uh, in Riga, Latvia now, and that's uh, Latvia is the country which received the bulk of uh, independent journalists, uh, prominently including the Moscow BBC bureau. Uh, so uh, Riga, where where I've been living for the last eight years, is now a bit like uh, Pavilatska metro station because I'm bumping into these people all the time. Um, but um, uh, of course, and I'm, I'm, I'm of course meeting uh, them a lot, and I'm talking about uh, this uh, disconnect with the audience that they still feel, uh, despite uh, despite being able to communicate on a daily basis with uh, with people back in Russia, and despite um, some of the correspondents uh, are working openly or in a clandestine way back in Russia. Um, <laughs> But um, how did it feel back then? How did you uh, manage to feel this connection and to maintain this uh, sympathetic tone, which, which, which is your trademark tone, which is why you were so popular in, in, uh, back in the Soviet Union? Um, it is, um, I, found it quite, I found it quite amazing because uh, you were you came there in seventy seven and the Soviet Union collapsed in nineteen ninety one and during this period there was some evolution going on cultural evolution going on there were new films being released um, music was appearing there was this uh, explosion of really good music in the in the ages of underground music uh, so how did you manage to maintain this connection well there were snippets of information coming here and there. Now, I start with the letters. They began to arrive in about 78. In 79, I uh, produced the first program based on letters. Now, letters would arrive through third countries. People who wanted to write to me uh, would give them to either students or visitors or tourists to be posted abroad. Uh, so I had the letters with them you know, stamps from Egypt, Albania, you know, you name it. I have an, uh, even a letter that was delivered in a bottle. Somebody threw a bottle with a note in it uh, somewhere around Denmark. And so it was washed ashore. Somebody picked it up, uh, took it out, and there was the scribble that seven of Gorotsov, BBC London. That was that was it. Maybe, so they maybe sent somebody to, was aware of your navigation past. <laughs> yeah. So they sent it maybe to London. Somebody considered you as a pirate or pilot. <laughs> so it was sent to London and it was translated into English. Uh, so BBC. So they sent it to the BBC. They said it's probably World Service. And at the World Service, they said it's probably Russian. So I got it in the end. I remember the comment, my comment. I said, I have no idea when this letter was through, thrown in the sea. But judging by the harsh political 
uh, phrases or tone of the letter, it must have been written after November 1917. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, and, 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 and the letters kept ca coming, and not all of them were deserving to be broadcast on air. And um, I couldn't just throw the old ones away. So the collection kept getting bigger and bigger. And finally, in 2010 or 12, I managed to, um, to collect them all in huge boxes. There was about 120 kilos of paper in there. And it was taken by the Hoover Institute um, for the uh, archive. And uh, so I said on air, then some 300 years later, somebody will write a PhD based on those letters um, taken from the copy, uh, copy books uh, for, for school children. So I got the, um, the feedback from the Hoover Institute, and they said that the letters are taking six meters and 34 centimeters of shelf space. <laughs> so we're part of history. I still remember one of letters you read and you were uh, on air when somebody with an anger uh, sent a letter to you like, for God's sake, stop, stop, stop uh, uh, saying bad things about our fatherland. And you responded that, yeah, I will respond to your letter when you, uh, you will learn to write fatherland with a small letter and God with a, with a capital one. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to ask you, um, yesterday Mark Pomer, who is also here, uh, said that probably uh, um, Russian, Putin, Russian uh, authorities now, they kind of robbed us of Russian language because Russian language, for at least for the last eight years, for many, became a, a language of propaganda and it's been used for many awful things. So um, what do you feel as a Russian speaker now, after the year of war, uh, of Russian war against Ukraine? Do you think that Russian language is, how to say, capable to resist what, what Kremlin and what, what Russian, uh, uh, you know, leadership did to it? Well, the best representatives of Russian culture and of Russian language are not necessarily all abroad, but many of them are in Israel and in Riga and in European countries. So they carry on the flag of culture and the tradition and the tone of discussion. So many of them are branded now as the uh, foreign agents in Agente. This is the new brand invented by Putin government and, um, um, you know, given freely to many, many, many people. I even had the idea the other day that it would be nice to organize a branch of radio broadcasting called the foreign agent and invite all those people who have been expelled from the country and who have a lot to say um, to be as anchor people, as uh, people who would interview those who are interested, uh, who, who, on whom they're interested. Anyway, so the Russian language should not uh, concern us. It will go on, it will live on, um, although the circumstances are obviously uh, difficult for it. Now, when I was in the Soviet Union being a musician, a jazz musician at that, you were always in the minority, and the majority around you was sometimes openly or not openly, but hostile. The language was different. People of the working class and the peasantry spoke different language, and we were separated from them then as we're separated from them now, except that the propaganda people speak beautiful Russian only for the wrong purposes and for, you know, have uh, wrong ideas about what they want to achieve. Jeff. Um, 
anyone who's experienced radio as a listener or as a broadcaster comes to consider it as an extremely intimate environment. It's a very intimate medium with which we all fall in love. Um, it, in today's chaotic media environment, digital environment, in which on the one hand, you can have instantaneous connection to audiences in a way that was not possible earlier in the radio era, but on the other hand, you lose that ability to have that soft-voiced conversation that is so intimate. There are very few soft voices in the media space today. The voices tend to be very loud. Were you given the opportunity to shape a program today to reach Russian speakers with important messages, how would you go about doing that in today's media environment? Well, first you start, you have to start as a um, record producer or any sound producer um, to check their microphone connections, distance to the microphone, and projection of people who, who speak into the microphone. I'm not making uh, personal or concrete comments, but I listen to Radio Liberty, which is obviously um, an American-based station. And uh, they often have interviews with people um, via internet. And those people who are being interviewed use their laptops. Now, the laptop obviously has a built-in microphone, and they don't bother check the distance to the microphone or how they sound. So they bring into the broadcasting uh, environment the sound of their room, you know, what we call the um, bathroom quality sound. Now that, uh, you know, that infuriates me enormously. So uh, technical checking to start with. Now, my personal story is when I started broadcasting, I wanted to get away from the Soviet delivery by the Russian presenters on the radio. So I spoke softly close to the mic, which um, <laughs> now is very funny to listen to because it sounds like um, um, some sort of Tom and Jerry um, um, uh, cartoon film character. <laughs> now that was deliberate and the audience egged me to have some more projection in the voice. So <laughs> eventually I reached the, uh, the, the balance. But the musician's ear is very helpful and very useful. And um, very often people who come into broadcasting come from kind of a non-musical background uh, and there is no understanding of balances and tone of voice and whatever. Um, by the way, Jeff, you would make a wonderful broadcaster in Russian if, if you wanted to, because <laughs> your voice is, uh, is uh, quite drawing in, attractive. I'm blushing. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I actually believe that Jeff didn't mean only technical side of all of this. I mean, uh, the emotional and probably uh, your message, the content of your message is also important. So how to make it more uh, empathic, more, more, more intimate as, a, as it was in your time now? Well, there's a such a, a term at the BBC called the talent, <laughs> and the, which was applied to me on a number of occasions. When things go wrong, technically, at the, at the recording sessions, I would never allow myself to reprimand or make comments or whatever. But obviously, my irritation was noticed. And one studio manager said to the other, the talent is upset. <laughs> <laughs> so you start with, with the talent. If the person has it, then you have a chance. I would suggest that you treat radio broadcasting or video broadcasting exactly as you do a film. You cast the right person, you 
as a, as a director, you put the feelers around and you see if, if this is going to work or not. Um, but uh, such fine, fine, fine judgment is not always available because um, in international broadcasting, all sorts of people work not necessarily with artistic sense of life uh, or ways to express it. I would easily reserve the pleasure to ask you questions only for myself and this crowd, but I, I, I'm sure that many people in the audience would, would ask you the questions. I, I see Mark Pomer here. Yes, please. Uh, first of all, it's a delight to see you, if only virtually. I wanted to let you know I ran the Russian service of VOA in the 1980s, and we spent a fair amount of time talking about you, uh, which I think you should be aware of, in a very complimentary way, uh, because we also had a popular music program, a whole series of popular music programs, and it was something that the VOA took very seriously, that we needed to communicate with the youth in the Soviet Union. And we made a d decision, which I was wondering to get your comment on, that we would have American voices talking about American music. So we purposefully hired Americans who had learned Russian, who had gone to the Soviet Union on a student program, who spoke good Russian, they made mistakes. Some of our old timers were always complaining to me, you know, another grammatical mistake came through. But they brought an authenticity when they talked about the latest hit or the latest musical or the latest film. And in a sense, we, we thought that also would be a way to connect to Soviets. It was very apolitical programming. There was virtually no politics whatsoever. And they indeed got letters. We got a, most of our letters to VOA came because of popular music or popular culture. So I thought you, were, you should at least be aware that, that you were a persona as well across the ocean. And we had a close relationship with BBC. I visited BBC. Uh, the directors of BBC came to VOA. So that's a wonderful period where I think we we worked in concert, I think. This is really interesting phenomena when you when you wanted actually music presented to, to sound foreign, to sound deliberate. Uh, it was very deliberately with an accent with that that it is we uh, American people delivering this music to you. And we also took made a decision. I in my book I write about it that we very much at VOA did not want to sound. Not only didn't want to sound Soviet, we wanted to show that Russian was an international language and could be spoken by people from all kinds of different backgrounds and that it had a certain charm to see an American who spent so many years studying a very difficult language and was able to go on the air and speak quite, quite freely. Um, Seva, what's your angle on that? Well, I heard a lot of complimentary comments on uh, VOA pop programs and they were true to the music and to the cultural background of that music and to the American kind of aura in, in, in general. So in that sense, it was authentic. It was an American product, although spoken in Russian, uh, on American music, and it was representative. But my aim was uh, different. I wanted to go kind of under the skin. I wanted the immediate contact. And therefore, <clears throat> I was using the popular folklore, which I kind of collected during years of my touring the, the Soviet Union. It was the folklore that existed within the youth circles. And I had to, to give it back. And that essentially was it. It was like... Um, I don't know, like rapping today. Uh, but I wanted to be as close to my audience as possible. But yes, I, I'm aware of Voice of America programs. In fact, I grew up listening to Voice of America Jazz Hour by uh, uh, Con Willie Conover. Willie Conover, yes. 
And he, he later came to the Soviet Union, and I had a I had the chance of meeting him and talking to him personally. But he was absolute legend. He had millions and millions of listeners in Eastern Europe and in the Soviet Union who were absolutely mesmerized by his voice. Although he didn't say anything special, he was just saying, this is Count Basie. But he, and what I found later, find out later, that um, he is just a producer within the Voice of America, uh, and that was about it. That was the end of his audience within the U.S. itself. So it was a shock for him when he came over that absolutely everybody and everybody knew him. So I am aware of that because I myself is a product of Voice of America brought uh, Jazz Hour. Uh, Nicholas Carr, please. Uh, thank you very much. It's, it's such a wonderful uh, session to to be in. Uh, as, as a historian, I know part of what was special uh, for your listeners was not not only that you knew them and could speak in a way that was informed by their experience, but also that you knew people in the British music scene and that you could both speak uh, from you could speak from personal experience of somebody like Freddie Mercury and uh, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your contact with uh, British musicians and which British musicians you think were most meaningful to your audience and and why uh, what was it in the in the British music scene the British rock music scene that that was exciting to a uh, particularly exciting to a Russian audience well I have to come clean with you uh, and tell you a terrible secret because of my time frame and uh, days which I allowed myself to prepare the program um, there was no way I could spend those days chasing British musicians and talking to them. And as a former musician myself, I can tell you another terrible secret. Musicians in their private conversations are very often very boring people and cannot talk about anything but themselves. So I prefer to use, by the end of my, my mid eighties, there was some rock literature coming out. There were journalists who would spend two or three months going on the road with the band, uh, collecting you know, different stories and anecdotes and putting them in a the, in the book form. So those books I would immediately buy and use them as a basis for my broadcasts. It was had another angle from the BBC producer's guideline point of view. Those books were obviously verified, checked by the editors. The facts were all correct. And if anything, I could always refer any criticism or any inquiries to those books. But it never happened. But so this is how I worked. I met a few musicians. I met uh, um, Paul McCartney and about half a dozen of other people. And uh, they were fun to, to talk to as, as it went. And I could just tell about the, the meeting itself, which was enough. And somebody asked me, how did you find Paul McCartney? And I said, I remember saying that he had that special ease of, um, of carrying itself, carrying himself and ease in conversation that comes with the first 500 million. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, our time now is, is, is over already and this session of full of secrets and revelations is, is over. But Sieva, thank you very, very much for being with us. It's a pleasure always to see you. Thank you to Jeff and thank you to Lonya. Thank you for everybody who asked the questions. And I urge you, please have the book because this book is about Sievan of Garotsev by Michel Daniel, and he, it's full of these secrets and revelations you just heard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.